We are on. Okay, welcome to the April 2nd, 2019 Facilities Committee meeting of the Rider Township School District. I'd like to start with introductions and administrative remarks. Anyone from the administration? No, we're good. No, okay. Mark, you'll need your mic to, there you go. Well, now I'd like to start with public comment. Is there any public comment? Going once, going twice. Mrs. Spurtle. Public comment? Public comments already? Sorry. <laughs> you could have I know, but. <laughs> you were so busy chatting. <laughs> I'm sorry. You I know. I'd hear about it later. Here, right? Is everybody giving me she knows money? where I live. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sore after pulling down all the weeds and the vines? Uh, very, very. Just don't ask them how much work I did. He didn't do any. That's why he isn't sore. Good evening. I'm sorry. Cindy Spurtle, 106 Valley Forge Terrace. Um, I have a question from the minute, on the minutes. Can I ask questions? On, not a correction, a question. And that was on the um, 1920 capital plan. Is there are no, no funds for the Sulpizio Gym or Matson Ford Bridge? And so the question I had, does this, what does this mean going forward? Um, is it safe to use both? I went on the tour of the gym. And what about the tri-party agreement where we have response, the school district has responsibilities for paying for repairs. Um, and then I'm looking forward to the discussion on the enrollment. I had a question not understanding on the, um, slide that shows students per sections fourth and fifth grade for um, eighth and elementary and it shows that they have the uh, DCI DCIU students that attend some of the special the classes does that mean that the class size doubles when they attend math social studies and science the, the numbers almost would bring it to to double or do they attend those classes at a different time also on that um, going through the whole report as someone an outsider it was mentioned several times the number of possible classrooms in each of the schools and that to me my understanding was that it meant those were extra classrooms. It didn't say extra, it did say possible, but that meant that all the classrooms were not being used until I got to the summary of the comparison. And it shows that um, number one, even though it said there was no pod space for Ithan, it says there's limited pod space in the summary. And also that the additional classrooms means that they have to reconfigure specific areas within the school so that what I had thought were were actual classrooms must not be actual classrooms and I was going to ask that that be clarified and then also and this may be the pattern I've been attending school board meetings for a while but that it looks like on the final slide uh, the P PEL the Pell report states it looks like um, an overload for K through 5 and then the number of students for the per school uh, it's actually less looking out to 2023 and just slightly higher for the middle school is that the way it, it has always been and then just a couple questions on the facility the capital improvement report um, and I, this has been brought up in the past by me and other people and the one is on the Radnor High School uh, I noticed on the um, for the exterior bleaches uh, from the prior capital plan that was shown in February to the one that's now dated April there it appears that we're moving the four hundred thousand dollars forward for a couple of years and um, the other <laughs> and then the question again is the the priority ranking it still shows the bleachers to be a safety priority but if 
uh, the study is still going on, I understand that, and if it's going to be pushed out further, uh, should that, I guess that the priority is not as dire as it indicates. And then also for the pool area and other areas on the high school, it shows that um, a certain amount was budgeted, so much has been spent year to date, and there's a balance remaining. Does that mean, like in the interior walls, the wrestling match walls, uh, is that project completed? It would be interesting to know whether that money is to be used before the end of the school year or if there's still more work to be done in the balance remaining column. If that was an, an additional explanation, that would be interesting. Thank you. Okay. Look forward to hearing some answers later. I'm sure Dr. Obarchuk will answer all of your building usage questions. So now, on to approval of the minutes. The minutes look good to you guys? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're fine. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now on to agenda item number one, the building capacity study presentation. Dr. Robarczyk. And Dr. Boylan as well. Oh, and Dr. Boylan. Two for the place or two for one tonight. So just to start off, to explain, the slides that had the uh, student per section cut off when it converted to a PDF. So I am going to give you just the, 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 those two slides to look at as part of the presentation. What page? Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm trying to think. I'm like, wait. Page five, That's it should be. Thank you. Three, three, cut off. Three, five, three, five. Five. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, whenever you are ready, please present. So, as we did last year, we looked at across the three elementary buildings in the district enrollment capacity and also the demographic study so this is sort of our uh, second annual so an update to last year and the purpose of our looking at all of these things was to have an annual review of the elementary school enrollment to look how it's changed from year to year in each of the buildings to look at how the elementary buildings are being used uh, based on that enrollment number what are we doing with each classroom and I can answer that classroom question and then the demographic study that was done by the Pennsylvania Economy League to see what they um, forecast for the future. So those are the three things we're going to look at. And just to clarify, the Pennsylvania Economy League has been working with us to put together their actual study. And um, right now they've just sent us a draft of some of the numbers, as you see, as part of the presentation. So we don't have the narrative component of that yet. But when they do complete that, it's due April 15th they're going to come in and share with us as well in further detail about that demographic study. On this slide, what you're looking at is just what our current enrollment is for the 18-19 school year. As you can see, Ethan Elementary is at 448 students, Radnor is at 628, and Wayne at 576. And then two columns over to the right of that number, um, in the red, you have the red column, then the black, and then the um, green. The green number is our current projected enrollment for next year at this time. These are the number of students we have registered. So kindergarten with 54 students at Ithin, so that's what you're looking at. It's not complete. This will increase over time. But as you can see, Dr. Boylan and Ithin Elementary are at 438 students. Radnor Elementary is at 581 students with 52 students registered in kindergarten. And Wayne Elementary with 528, with 35, uh, I can't even read my own number, 38, 38, 38 um, students registered in kindergarten. The column to your um, right is the projected number of sessions, sections we will have for each of the grade levels. And so you can see right now, there's 24 at Ithin. I'm sorry, this will be projected, 24 at Ithin, 28 at Radnor, and 27 at Wayne Elementary. The next column you see there with the highlighted 1920 pending registrations, those are registrations that people have made appointments with our central registrar, but have not come in to complete the registration process. 
So we would add 54 and 10 together? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yep. And, it's, and it's early. It's only April. This is April. So we so. encourage anyone who has students coming to us next year to register, especially kindergartners. How, how does this compare to this time last year? So this time last year, um, well, the, last couple of years. the last couple of years, Ethan Elementary is definitely ahead of the game. Um, there are more students registering in the kindergarten class at Ethan than there has been the last, I think I went back three years. Um, so they are, their numbers are actually up. In regards to Radnor and Wayne Elementary, their numbers are down comparable to where we were at this time last year and the year before. Now, it doesn't mean to say that they're going to come in next month or the following month, but it gives some indication that maybe at R Radnor and Wayne we're starting to see a little bit of a decrease in those classes. We, I mean, the bubbles come through. And you'll see that on this next slide, actually. We put together our 10-year enrollment data. And as you can see, from 2009 all the way to 2018-19, there's not one building that's been consistent. Um, the red is obviously a negative change between one year to the next, and the green being a positive. And there's no rhyme or reason. If you look at Wayne Elementary, in 2009 to 2009-10 to 2010-11, we had a minus 23 students from within that year change. But then you go right back to 2011-12 to 2012-13, where 43 students were added. So again, there's really no rhyme or reason, but what it does show here is there's definitely a fluctuation among all three elementary schools um, in regards to the increases and decreases in enrollment over a 10-year period. Just refer them to the, the <coughs> handout. This one. Mm -hmm. So these are the new pages five and six that you have, and that's looking at students per section K to three on the first page in all three of the buildings, Ethan, Radnor, and Wayne Elementary. And if you just look across, we're looking at what is the what is the average in the in the number of classes. So at Ethan in kindergarten, we have four classes. You can see the numbers, and then the averages for Ethan, Radnor, and Wayne. So with the goal of having no more than 21 students in a class in kindergarten. Um, Ethan this year is, is slightly below that. Radnor is right around 20. And then Wayne is at 18.2 in our kindergarten class sizes. If you look at first grade. Susan, Susan has a question. Oh, quick, it's a quick question. Okay. Um, and actually, was, I was looking for it. Um, I know it's somewhere in the report. What you, The class size guidelines. Just not for nothing, but I would have loved to have seen that in that red arrow just because to reference it right where the information is. But if you could just tell it to me, I'll jot it down. It's, so it's, I have to. <laughs> I was going to say, which page do we have? K through three. I know we have it in ours. Preferably below 20. Yes. Yeah, it's preferably, 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 preferably below 20, but no more than 21. No higher than 21 no higher is the relevant 21. number for me. And then here. Four, five, and then four, four or five. five. Thank you. It's no higher than 25, correct. Thanks. I knew I knew it. I just want it right there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So then if you look similarly for first grade, and um, these numbers were taken from November, and actually at Ethan Elementary, you can never predict we had more first graders move in. So all of our first grade classes are right now at 22. So sometimes that happens. You have the goal of... Um, 21 as a guideline, and new students move in in specific grades. But in K to 3, and if you look at the new pages, third grades included, um, we kept underneath that number of 21 students everywhere except Ethan's first grade this year. And again, so what that does is at the cutoff at the beginning of August is when maybe we make that determination of our staffing for each of the elementary schools. So if numbers increase between the beginning of August and the start of school, we would obviously would always come to you as the board and say, you know, you know how to approach it and give our recommendations based on the makeup of the classes. But then if that number goes above the 21 for each class as, after the school year starts, we collaborate with the principal, the teachers, and decide what would be the best approach. Would it be having a paraprofessional circulating through the three classes, Sometimes there are grade levels that just don't want any other support. They want to keep it the way it is. So we do offer that as an option. 
And then, then on the next page, page six, where we look at fourth and fifth grade, and again, with our guideline of 25 is what we shoot to not go over. Um, what happened with Ethan, um, again, is we started the year with a certain number of students, and we had six new fourth graders join us. And that is the grade that we currently have nine students from the Delaware County Intermediate Unit. Um, in fourth grade who push into our classes and that's what that um, row that says math social studies and science when those students push in for math science and social studies the class size gets larger and we also have a couple of students who push in for math so again the decision was made we added an additional section so we have a part-time teacher a teacher who works point six and um, she actually teaches one class of math, one class of science, one class of, class of social studies. So when those nine additional students push in, we actually divide into four sections. So it isn't the whole day, it's just certain parts of the day. So we have times of the day where we take the uh, 52, the 80 something kids and divide them into four classes because we get 80 something plus nine students who are pushing into mainstream I guess my question is why aren't those classes just four classes all day long is that the part-time teacher you're using yes okay I think that's a, a great question I'm sorry and say that again I, I think that's that's something for us to discuss moving forward I would just would have thought the mechanics of that would be tough, but so it's a, okay. that's something that we were just recently discussing last week. That idea that when the numbers are looking like this, a lot of it also depends on what we know in August, and you know because the decisions are made in August, sure. and then we build it around what we know. Um, if we had similar numbers, or if we're looking at numbers similar to this, it started to beg the question for us: why not just add a full section? Um, and that's something we're going to consider for next year, because reality we are looking at with the sections with the teachers. It was coming up to a point six or a yes. Yeah, it was a point six of a teacher um, that we were adding. Okay. What's the significance of that date, eleven nine eighteen? That was the date we captured. We did capture um, the the numbers on that date. Oh, thank you. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So, an overview of our building capacity. So we, um, as part of the process, we looked at every room, available space in each of those rooms that was accounted for. Um, Tony, we looked before, at class you, before you jump to the next session, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt, just to close out the class size piece. As of the August date, did we meet all of our guidelines? Were we no higher than 21 K to 3 and no higher than 25 and 4 to 5 in August? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So that overview of the building capacity, we looked at classrooms, the cafeteria and slash little theater, the offices, and the non-instructional rooms. Non-instructional rooms being the smaller rooms um, that may be used for storage or for just, um, what am, what's the other piece I'm thinking of, Tranya? We, 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 we identified this as different rooms. Just rooms that were used for different purposes. That might be a small office or a small space. Uh, at Ethan, we have um, a room that uh, our social worker works in. You, you really right. can't meet with students in there. It's just a small room that you can't really call an office. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Multi-use room. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, a form, a form of closet. closet. Could we, be. We use we use every square inch. Pardon? Yes, exactly. That's kind of the the non-instructional use room. So we went into, um, Tranya worked with all three elementary principals in gathering the, the data of the square footage, and she's going to review each of the schools in regards to what their availability is. Right, so to answer that first question, is the first number on each slide is how many homerooms, how many sections of students do we have at Ethan this year? And that's 22. But then we have classrooms that are used for other purposes. In other words, at Ethan we have five rooms. One is used by our English learning teacher, one is used by our wellness teacher for a special class. One is used for music. One, we have a learning support teacher who's using an empty classroom this year. So if that classroom wasn't available, she would probably be moved to another smaller space. But we take advantage of that when um, that's available. And then overflow mainstream, that's when we took our three fourth grades, we divide them into fourth classrooms, we use that classroom for that. 
So we got that total, total possible classrooms that if we had to, if our enrollment grew to 27 sections of students, we do have 27 classrooms where those students could live, but we would have to figure out how then, where would we put our English learning teacher? Would our wellness teacher and music teacher have to operate on a cart? It isn't what we want, but that's what that number means. Absolutely not what we want. Um, no, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not just shaking my head. To, I, I don't think you can find a parent in Radnor with, that would say that's an acceptable solution to right. a space issue. Right. We don't pay the taxes we pay to have music on a cart and have our children in one classroom disturbed by a music cart that's moving around and the students, I, I mean, and, and we owe that kind of respect to the music professionals that we hire in the district as well. I would agree as the mother of a music teacher who did music on a cart, and it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for it's them. Very difficult. You don't get the same program, certainly. No. Not at all. Could be developing marching band, though. Showcase teacher. And then we tried to describe other rooms. And at the three different buildings, we have a slightly different configuration, but. An other room in Ethan, in other words, it's not a classroom, we have an art room, we have a library, we have the gymnasium, and we do have a technology lab. So again, they could be used for different purposes, but that's what they are used for right now. At Ethan Elementary, we have the annex, so there are six classrooms in that building. Right now, all of those are used by the Delaware County Intermediate Unit. In the lodge, we have eight rooms, and they are not used during the school day. Um, they are used for before and after school care, and they're also used for, we've kind of spread out and used all of this space for before and after school clubs that are sponsored by our PTO. It's nice to have that space. Sometimes we have three scout troops meeting there um, after school. We do occasionally for International Week, something special, our PTO sets up in that room and our students travel up there for something like that, but it's not typically used. And then we just tried to capture um, what was in place in all of the in all of the classrooms with the kindergarten class sizes. You can see there at Ethan they are of generous size and it, it works out nicely. The cubbies are actually maintained inside the classroom for three out of those four rooms. And then the classroom size in grades one through five. And then we looked at our enrollment and for this we used Tranya, I'm sorry, okay. interrupted, no, no cause only because I, I know the setup at Ethan. So you said the cubbies are in the kindergarten room. The um, class size, you're not counting the hallway outside of where the cubbies are and the little bathrooms are when you say the classroom size for one through five, right? You're just talking about the open area inside the wall. Yes. Thank you. Yep. And then we capture that. We, we went back and forth on what to call that. We did eventually call that pod space at Ethan just to kind of use the same. <laughs> right. So it's a, diff, it's a, it's different, a different type different of type. pod. <laughs> Pea <Wait>. pod. <laughs> Wait, literally. Well, they are. It, yeah. No. They okay. are small. We recognize that too. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. I meant PEA. <laughs> and then again, we, we looked at our, our shared space, our whole school space, and at Ethan Elementary, that's our cafetorium, and we looked at if we have our entire enrollment in there of the 469 students, how much space does that give? Again, just so we could compare equally between the three elementary schools. And then we looked at if, um, if you just had a, a grade level that had 100 students in, and they were in the cafetorium, and if you had a class, a grade level that had 125 students. And then just to note, at Ethan, we don't have a little theater. We use the cafetorium for our whole school meetings. And then we did something similar for all of the schools, for Radnor Elementary, following that same format that we used for Ethan Elementary, and including the pod space including the, cafeter the cafeter cafeteria and the little theater and what space that would be. And then the same on the next page for Wayne Elementary. And I think the easiest way to look at that is the next, where it's the comparison, where you can compare all three schools across. And again, I think it's... Well, hang on, no, I do have a question about that because I noticed this and I couldn't figure out why, why it was done this way. On the um, page with Ethan, did you break it down and do the? Oh, you did it in two different ways. I was I couldn't find the. I'm having a hard time finding the cafeteria. 
um, and little theater breakdown by 100 kids per, per grade. The, the fifth Susan's bullet. Next to the I think that's on there, Susan, that's but there. the whole show. Well, hang, hang on a second. Just say, where is it, Tony? The fifth bullet. Here. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, fifth from the bottom. One, yep. two, three, four, five. I think what I'm, uh, is, the reason is that you are, what does this word SF stand for? Square footage. Oh, okay, thank you. So the reason that it's broken out kind of the way that you did it for Radnor is that there is a separate cafeteria and little theater space Correct. that you did the calculation separately. I just don't know, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. I, now I'm following what you did. Okay. That's a different presentation than what we got in the packet. Because mine only has, my L. Ithan only has 100. Yes, we, we you went back and added that. that. Cool. Yes. Okay. I thought we had Because the class, Sorry. I mean, it, and I, I get that these fluctuate from year to year, but when I look at Ithan here, it doesn't look like there's more than 80, there are more than 80 students in any individual grade. Not much more than 80. Yeah, so we, did, so we just used 100 and 125. The okay. average. Okay. Yeah. So, and then we looked at the comparison of all three buildings. And I know, and this was somewhat controversial because we're saying we weren't going to compare square footage to square footage, but we wanted to just at least see what it looked like from school to school to better understand the, the amount of capacity that's, the capacity that's there. This was kind of exactly what I had asked for for months. Tranya knows this is exactly the comparison that I was asking about is the relative space for e at each of the three schools. So thank you. Um, uh, when you look at the pot area, and, and I don't know, so for, we, I think you're saying that 679 square feet is where they hang their clothes. Yes. In the hallways. Which at Radnor the they have to put in the classroom, which makes it not necessarily apples to apples in terms of classroom space, but I get it, it's very hard. The question I have though, when you're saying there's 1,300 square feet of pod space at Radnor Elementary, that's what's left of the cut up pods that have actually been turned, they've all been turned into classrooms. It's That's what's left of the pod still. Okay. In there, like on each side of those built classrooms that were built into the, the, the like space pod. for two tables on one end and space for a table on the other end, or that's all like teacher shelving and library stuff. But we did floor space. We did okay. available floor space. We didn't count anything that was taking okay. up room out. Okay. Because because in some of the I mean in some of the grades the teachers have shelving up and they've got books and everything so it's turned into yeah. storage space so I just want to make sure that's yes. this is this only is what's left after all that space available space. correct okay so as you can see from the number of classrooms right now Ethan has 22 <laughs> Renner 31 and Wayne has 30 the number of possible classrooms as we were talking about before those are the classrooms such as music, art, that we could convert into a classroom if necessary and go into a cart, but I know that's not the favorable component, but that's what the, the rationale is there for saying possible classrooms. So can I ask, just for the sake of argument and to be difficult, why at Ithan, so, so I guess I don't understand what makes an art room an other room and a music room a classroom. Because at Ithan, it, 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 is a classroom. It's okay. exactly like a first grade classroom. And I've been classroom. there. I've seen it exactly. I know what you mean. Where I but think at Radnor, the, it's not. At, at Radnor, it's not. And right. it's not. It's, it's a, a it's windowless a, cinder block room behind the theater. I mean, right at Radnor, there's the the, music the room. instrumental music room. room and the general music classroom. Right. There's the instrumental right. component, and then there's the music class. Right. S but we treated that like a classroom again at Radnor. The music room. Right. So why is that different than the art room, which is bigger and it gets more light? I'm not trying to get rid of art either. i just trying to figure out how we characterize, because it's so much bigger. The art rooms are so much bigger than the music rooms. We just, we just counted, we counted it the same in all three buildings, that the art room was a dedicated space. It would make a really nice classroom, I agree. But we just, when we were calculating, we left the, the gym, the library, the art room alone. Okay. So, so at Radnor, when you talk about their classrooms being used for special purposes and you say traveling specials, are you saying we have so many music classes that may be going on at once that the, somebody else's classroom is getting used for music because when Ms. Williams isn't teaching, there's a traveling music teacher using another classroom to teach music? Yes. So the Ithan specialists, because we have fewer sections, mm -hmm. one day a week 
our specialists travel over to Radnor Elementary. Mm -hmm. In the past, it's been Radnor Elementary and Wayne Elementary, so that we had um, equity between the number of classes that the specialists were teaching through the three buildings. Okay. So in other words, at Ithan, our teacher, our specialists are teaching 22 sections. They travel over to Radnor this year and teach four other sections. Okay. And so Radnor's teaching 26. The teachers in Radnor only 26 have 26 or 27 sections? classes as well. Okay. Yeah. The the I think get one less because they the need travel the travel time. time and that prep time. Right. Okay. And there are some times if there are six sections mm -hmm. that the music teacher at Radnor is teaching in the music room or the librarian is teaching in the library and so our specialists would teach in that kind of other traveling instrumental specialist room. room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have kids not getting the regular Radnor program because we're so busy. We're not getting them. They're getting the regular program. They're just in a different location. So they're not getting library in a library? No, they are. Okay. They're in the library. They, they divide two parts of the library up. There's okay. the nook area and that at Radnor, right. that back room, and then Amy may take the kids over by the smart board, and they may switch or however they configure their time and their lessons, but so, they are getting the same but, program. But some, people but are getting some music or not getting the same music program as if they had Miss Williams. I mean, is, are they same getting music curriculum. on a cart in a different same classroom, curriculum. though? Same goals, meeting the same standards. Okay. They are, yes. So, so is that music teacher having to bring instruments over, or is she from borrowing Williams from... From Williams' room of time, yes. Okay, but it's not like she's having to haul all that over from Ethan, necessarily. No. Okay. Sometimes. If, if she, some if, equipment. It's selective yes. in regards... If she wants something in particular that she wants to deliver to that class, she will bring stuff that maybe Michelle does not have. Okay. In that sense, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. In looking at some of the, the math, it's kind of raising a question for me, which is, um, now I know the answer to this at Ithan, but I'm curious how it works, practically speaking, at um, Wayne and Radnor. So I know that throughout lunchtime, the auditorium space, I'll call it Little Theater, but the auditorium space at Ithan's not available during lunchtime because it's the same space and it's lunchtime. And it's, you know you can see pretty clearly on here, really the 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 just the difference. I won't I won't use a word other than that. The difference between that how the space is configured at Ithan, where it's the same space versus Radnor and Wayne. It's two different spaces. Practically now that does that has the effect of two things. That makes it seem like the cafeteria is kind of big for Ithan, although it's not really big, but it's a little bit bigger than than. It's actually not even that much bigger than um, than Radnor Elementary, but it's those two spaces, those three spaces. When you have the whole grade in there, that's where some of the disparity of space shows up. When you use not the average class size, but what we actually have as the largest class size currently at the three buildings, mm -hmm. this is where some of the disparity and I think the the experience of things feel crowded comes up. Is when you look at the actual class sizes that we actually have at the three buildings. And, and kind of do the math throughout the three spaces. But my question to you becomes this. Do you utilize the little theater and the cafeteria space at the same time for lunch? Or are they, do you have it separated and you're only using cafeteria space at lunchtime um, at Wayne and, and Radnor? They are separated. They do not open the doors for lunchtime. Because it's carpeted. Okay, so the space that's there for lunch is there for the cafeteria that's okay it. and then for the so little give you a great example today we had a meeting in the little theater at Wayne mm -hmm. and the ca lunches were going on correct okay and then the um, the little theater area how is that utilized at Radnor and Wayne and all I mean to say is do you ever have opportunities where the entire grade is there or it's only one or two classes at a time because that space in and of itself, Little Theater is really rather small. Now, when you put it with the cafeteria, it's all a nice big area. But if you're only, only utilizing the Little Theater at either Wayne or Radnor, is there a time when you're only utilizing it for an entire grade or, or only for a class or two of a particular grade? Sure. I'll, I'll speak to Wayne a little bit just sure. because of my knowledge there. Um, the one piece that Radnor has that Wayne does not have is an instr instrumental room. So instrumentals are taught in the little theater. 
Um, if it is used for an assembly, it's generally either grade level or we break it up. It's broken up K to two, three, three to five. So they do break it up so they can fit the students in there um, for smaller uh, programs. But generally, it's being, it can be utilized for that fashion of smaller grade level assembly programs or half the schools in there or a quarter of the school along those lines. Okay. I, I'm not sure do you, when speaking with Anthony about in, uh, what the little theaters use for during the day because they have the instrumental room there, um, classroom where they teach instrumental lessons. Um, so I'm not sure really if that gets utilized. You mean the theater side of the Radnor? Oh, yes. That gets used for various things. I mean, different. I mean, I'm sure assembly programs. And yeah, things, assembly like programs and special things. But yeah, they use, they will use it sometimes. Now that they don't have pods anymore, they have to use it for grade level yeah. programs. I just don't ever remember seeing too many people in there during the day in the little theater. It, it varies. It a varies. Lot based, I mean, yeah. it's much more special programming. It's not like they have yes. to do the instrumentals. And, mm -hmm. and Susan, you brought up a good point just about the class sizes and the number and the sections and everything. The problem with doing that is it just varies from year to year. We get these bubbles that come through, so it's kind of hard to just wrap our heads around. This is exactly what it would look like, obviously. But Well, I kind of key, uh, um, cued Ken up that at the end of this presentation, you know, we might, I, I know I have a couple of more math calculations that I might ask you guys for. Sure. As much as I appreciate, and this is super informative, mm -hmm. it does bring other questions to mind. But let me yeah. let you finish with no what problem. you're doing. Thank you. So as you can see, we, and we talked about the cafeteria and the little theater areas. Um, if you look at, um, I wanted to point out, where was it? Oh, the grade five, one through five pod space. Again, that is based on Ethan, that's being the hallways outside of the classrooms. That does not include the little, the closets there, the, the water closets, whatever you want to call them. Um, but then Radnor is, again, like you said, Sarah, the two on each side of the um, district built classrooms that are in there and then Wayne is again just that inside part of the um, each pod area so it kind of goes into the main entrance of the grade level space and there's that pod area um, the technology lab as you can see Ethan does still Ethan and Radner both still have a, a designated technology lab where Wayne um, this was a few years back now where we did um, reutilize that room um, because we, the Wi-Fi was not an issue at Wayne either. So we were able to um, utilize our technology throughout the building in different ways. The auxiliary gyms are kind of, um, they're there. They're a little misleading. The Radnor one is very tiny. It's a small room. It's like a gymnastics room. And then Wayne Elementary is the, um, the auxiliary gym is connected directly to the big gym. It's next to Mr. Blaha's office. It's more utilized for storage and those type of things because he doesn't have a lot of storage up there. Um, but that can be utilized as an auxiliary gym, and that has been in the past when Mr. Midget has come over for extra, um, to teach an extra special at Wayne Elementary. Any other questions about this slide before we move on? So as you can see, as part of the, the summary here, that Ethan Elementary is our school that hosts the DCIU program. We have two programs there, the Intensive Learning Support and the Language Program. Um, again, they have about 20 students in grades three to five. Nine of those do uh, are included for science, social studies, and math specials, lunch, and recess. So they do, they are in, pardon? All, tw all 20. All 20, like that's right, are specials like and, four. yes, and lunch and recess. So they, they are included as much as possible as we go through throughout the day. So based on the current number of classrooms, each of the three elementary schools are able to host additional classes if we were again to reutilize the space for those instructional areas. I know that's a no, but I'm just, we're just putting it out there. Um, and what we did find is grades one through five, our classrooms are comparable in size. If you go back, and I'll just speak to it briefly, when looking at the average of the classroom sizes for grades one through five, Ethan was 676.5, Radner being 819 square feet, and Wayne being 879. And what we literally did was we took all the classrooms in that grade level, added them up, and divided by the number of classrooms to get that average. So we did include those, the district-built classrooms as well at Radnor Elementary. Um, Ethan is the, contains the limited pod space, as we know, having just the hallway area um, of the two buildings, of the, th of the three buildings. Um, 
there's no little theater, and they, they do not have an auxiliary gym at this time. Um, Wayne does not have the dedicated technology lab, as we mentioned. I remember one of the pieces that you had calculated, but I think we chose to leave it off here, was the hallway space in the buildings? Correct. What was our thinking with that and that piece, and just what was some of the comparison? So when we looked at the hallway, the one thing was that Tronya's building, um, her hallways are actually outside. It's that California-style school, obviously. So really, a, they do transport students, the teachers, around that inside courtyard and utilizing those hallways. So in regards to Wayne and Radner, the hallways at Radner are obviously much bigger. They're more luxurious, luxury in regards to the space they have, but they're not really meant for instructional <laughs> use. They're not areas where you can have students or a teacher or even a paraprofessional or a parent out there doing some remediation or enrichment opportunities because it's just too distracting as people are walking by. So if you go back to the last slide. Remember this discussion now. So this the, the last slide, the one previous, that was the challenge with what to call the pod areas because yes. really at Ithan, that pod area is actually, you could argue as a hallway. Oh, wow. I mean, that's where I walk when I walk from building oh, to building. The, so, people might look no, at you funny if you do that. That's but, not in But my, I do. No, it's not. We got that information this was not one that, here. So this was one that after we met and talked about it a little bit, we did decide to call that area, that hallway, a pod area. We kept going back and forth with it. We didn't know what to do with it. So I think that's why there ended up being a change in there is we took out the hallway and put that as in the pod area. Whoa, 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 whoa. Go ahead. Wait, so when you're, just again, because I yep. know the setup at sure. Tyson, when you say a pod area, let me try to say this carefully. Is Light, that really a hallway? <laughs> well, because of the way the hallways are at Ithan, it's it's a long rectangle. It's it, and you can't utilize the space. You can only hang on a second. If you're going to call those the pod areas, you really have to call it the space in front of any one classroom because no grade, no classroom can utilize any more square footage than what's right outside their space because otherwise they're in, you know, the next teacher's space and it's not, you can't go there. In fact, I mean, the kids have to go outside to walk around because we have to be quiet, which is all great. I mean, I love the school, don't get me wrong, but that gives such a different impression of if you want to really count is. that learning space as, or that space as something that's usable, which there is a portion of it that's usable. Mm -hmm. That I'm, I'm thinking that what that is, is is the sum of all of those square foot spots in front of the entire first grade wing. Correct. Yeah. That's what it is. Which is not available to any classroom. It's only, if you're going to put that there, you have to go back and just measure the section right in front of the actual classroom area. That's a more... I think accurate comparison because you know m uh, Mrs. Siegel has the space available to her right side outside of her class. Mrs. Ball or Doyle, you know, they have what's right outside their their classroom, but no other part of that hallway is theirs. So, all due respect of using mm -hmm. it, those pod areas are much, much, much smaller than 679 square feet. Do you, you, you hear what I'm saying, Ken? Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And no. That, and and by I, the way, I would have raised that, but that's not on my presentation. Yeah, it's, right. it's not in the older versions. And I, it actually does raise the question so, for me that pod area is of Radner is after you've built out the classrooms, they still have that common area of... Correct. Okay, thank yes. you. Yeah, and that was the challenge with Ethan on how to, because in reality, as you walk by the first grade or the second grade classrooms, it is a, it is a hallway as you walk by. Now, is there a table squeezed in between the half wall that the yeah. where the classroom starts and, you know for pull-out purposes or at times, could a student be out at a table working with somebody right there? Yes. But this became the challenge of hallways versus pod, which you're right, Ethan really doesn't have pod. Ethan has a walkway there that gets utilized some space. with some space. Um, but <coughs> it's, it's, to call it a pod is a stretch. It's not even about the definition. It's about the space that it's it implies actually, I know what you're saying. the space yeah. that's actually available to a and teacher. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, the next portion we're going to just talk about briefly is just the building resources. And again, we talked about um, the first bullet are the specialists. So we have art, music, health and wellness, physical education and library. 
um, all instructional specialists right now have their own space within each elementary building, and I heard we want to continue that. Um, Caseloads for occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapy varies from year to year, uh, but we do have what we call our small group instruction space, so it could be a classroom that's been divided in half, it could be a small office that our related service providers use. Um, we talked about the Ithan specialist who traveled to Wayne and or Radnor. Last year it was both Wayne and Radnor. This year it's just Radnor Elementary. When um, those sections um, exceed five sections per grade level. Indoor recess in all three of the buildings, the students um, are supervised in their classrooms because typically a phys ed class is taking place in the gym. It would be great if that was available, but it's not. Um, and then again, we have grade level or all school assemblies usually are held in the combination of the cafeteria and little theater at Radnor and Wayne and in the cafetorium at Ithan Elementary. Lunches in all schools, um, we stagger by grade. So each grade is in the cafeteria by themselves, um, and then they transition to or from recess. That speaks to all of our resources. Mm -hmm. The next two slides that you're going to see is just a draft of some of the information the Pennsylvania Economy League, Economy League has provided it to us at this time. Um, and as you can see, in K grades kindergarten through five, there is a slight increase as you go over the next five years from 1,700 students to 1,900 students. At the uh, middle school, there is a slight dip and then it goes back up again. So, but they, and over the, over the overall five years, they are to increase. And the high school, as you can see, starts at um, our current of 2,200 or 1,200, 20 students and decreases over time somewhere about 1,100 students, just below 1,100 students. So our, our district is going to continue to increase in regards to enrollment numbers based on birth rates. Remember, this is just birth rates right now. We do have a, a plethora of other information and other data points as the Pell um, report is going to be brought forward to us. We included, um, we did get information regarding housing sales. Um, we found out that we have about an average of 300 ho houses for sale and selling per year in um, Radnor Township. It's not broken up by area of uh, elementary, um, but that's the overall of what we know is about 300 houses sell per year throughout the, the township. And um, some of us just buy right again in the township, and so right it doesn't buy, save right, you anything. So that house is for sale, then sold, and for sale again. Um, so I, I have a question just um, when you guys are going back to Pell, yes. one of the things that sticks out to me here is you know, that's a pretty significant trend upward in our elementary school program. What I'm seeing, if I do the math of um, taking that 1941 that we're projected to have as our elementary school enrollment and divide that by five and then multiply it back by four, so assuming that that population holds steady, we'll have 1,500 kids up at the high school four years later. Later. And they are going to provide that trend of another additional we five years. We need to years. really be watching the the the, the bubble as it the goes. 24, mm -hmm. The 24, you know, the 2023, and I would, looking at the trend of numbers, I would even say the trend starting in about, uh, I think that the 23, 24 year that we're seeing here for the high school mm -hmm. is the beginning of, well, go three years out and you'll see that middle school, which is, you know, holding pretty steady. That fourth year out will be the beginning of a pretty significant rise with high school population unless something shifts. So not for nothing, but that's probably something to be asking Pell if they would opine on that long range number for the high school. Yeah, so what, since getting this um, preliminary number, I've gone back to the Pennsylvania Economy League and requested two things. One was another five year stretch of doing the numbers. And then the other thing was just because of seeing the increase of over 300 students or just about 300 students at the elementary level over five years, I did ask them to break it out to elementary schools the best they can. Now, again, they're predictions. They're not exact. But the last time that Pell did the, um, the report, they were all within that 10% plus or minus range, which is acceptable overall within a demographic study. Radner was the only one that they were off for last year and this year. 
and now they're coming back around based on the current projections for next year. They're back into the range of below 10% um, of being off. So I think they're, they're pretty accurate overall. I think we've been pretty satisfied with them over the years. And regards to, we really um, took them to task this year when they were doing this update and really asked them to go beyond the birth rates because we really wanted to get a better idea of where people are within the township. And even we, we looked at um, the permits being pulled for reconstruction of the houses being sold and restored into new properties. Mm -hmm. Can't predict, but at least helps. What's permitted and what's happening are <laughs> yeah. two different things. Yeah. So that was a big, thank you, that was a big question that I know we talked about when we decided to go back out to Pell is, you know, just from my point of view, both financially and from a facility standpoint, um, we've had other school districts local to us be very um, hamper, you know, very caught off guard and really challenged by unexpected increases in their enrollment. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I continue to believe it's really important for us to ask, whether it's Pell or somebody else, for us to try to get a good understanding of what were the dynamics that were going on in those other districts, mm -hmm. and are they, dis are they dynamics that are likely to occur in Radnor? You know, you can say that some of these uh, towns are all built out. You know, the, the general feeling is that southeastern PA, or at least right proximate to us, is already all built out. Well, in fact, we continue to find pockets that can be rebuilt out, and it, but I'm not, abs I'm not 100 percent convinced that that is the source of, of the big spikes in enrollment that some of the other school districts are ex experiencing. And whatever it is for them, you know, for us, we need to have a good handle on if that's likely to happen, because even the overall enrollment, you know, K through 12, five years from now, we'll have 250 kids more and, or, well, 215 maybe, but the, um, uh, I don't think that our population in Radnor is expected to grow that much, so do we have an increasing number of people who are opting to use, you know, our really good public schools, but we need to have a good understanding of, because we're not going to see that in housing trends. Correct. We're not going to see the decision that families will make to select the public school over private and parochial schools in housing trends or in real estate transfers. Mm -hmm. Just saying. And the only response I can give to that is doing federal, uh, being involved with federal programs and watching those non-public school numbers. Looking back over the last three years, they really haven't changed much. Okay. So that's where you have to, you know, take into consideration that there is new construction going on, and a lot of rehabbing construction. Um, as you know, right down from the Jaguar dealership, there's I think you mentioned it too, Mike. There's 22 apartment condos going into that area you know, younger families, bringing in younger children, possibility. But the thing is that they'll stay. You know, they'll move in, you know, like you were explaining, Sarah, you move from one part of the township to another. So those are the things we have the most difficulty in keeping track with until they actually register. But So the next, the, the final slide of the presentation, all we did here was just look at our current population across each of the grades. Um, and then did an average, basically taking those five years in each grade level and saying, this is about the average of what we're looking at for each grade level. So again, it correlates. We are going to have that increase at the elementary level. You know, looking at the different grade levels and understanding where the more, they're, you know, the larger classes are going to be. You know, we're looking at first grade and third grade as two of the larger classes as we go into those next five years. But again, they're going to vary from year to year as the bubbles go through. So but it will be something we continue to keep an eye on. The, Susan, the one other comment I just wanted to make is once we do get the Pell report, one of the, my, the plans I have is I would like to meet with, you know, administrators from the surrounding districts to find out their, de you know, to look at their demographic studies and really understand where their increases came from and see if they had similar trends or not. I think that's smart. Because Pell will not do it for us. They, they just don't do that. That's not their <coughs> scope, scope of work that they complete. Okay. Tony, we talked before, and I apologize, I meant to ask you this before the meeting. Did you ever get a chance to talk to the architect from Radnor Elementary about the increases and in building out all the pods that we've done? On and off, on and off. And okay. once I said that I wasn't going to use them for the capacity, unfortunately, they weren't okay. too giving. But basically, they, there's, there's two different versions out there. Yep. The building was built the way it was, and then there's the building that was built to 
in order to be able to expand internally since you couldn't go out the footprint of the building. Okay. So which of those is... No, I, I ask because I'm looking at this 10-year data and Ethan has only lost students over that 10 years. I mean, they've never been as high as they were in 2009. Now it's 15 kids, 18 kids. It's mm. not a huge number. But Radner and Wayne over the years have sustained some really big increases. I mean, Wayne had 634 students one year. But, I mean, Radner is up almost 70 over the last 10 years. And I think, I mean, it, it's, it's just worth really paying attention to how, where the booms are, too. I mean, there are pockets of our township that are big child booms. I just moved out of one of those neighborhoods, and there were 12, element, 12 kindergartners in four blocks in one year. I mean, it's, it, there are parts of the township like that, and we need to be aware of them and understand that that's where those kids are coming from, and it's going to affect, you know, how all of our capacity works at all the township and all the different elementary schools. And I, I over <laughs> this, obviously, we have one more slide, and you're talking about that. It's the current practices and possible considerations. Sorry about that. I thought I got to the end. Um, uh, we're going to continue with our annual enrollment reviews. I think these are just very beneficial to us and yeah. helping us to understand. Literally, if you, starting February 1st when we open enrollment, kindergarten and new, new first graders, um, we start looking at the numbers every two weeks. Once we get to April 1st, we start looking at the enrollment every week, all the new registrations. So it gives us a better idea of what we need to plan for. Um, this is just one of the considerations of one of the practices that we've explored and talking about in the past. We've obviously have never done this, but consider phase-in of new families within the township that could allow for a shift in enrollment numbers. And what I mean by that is those, if you look at certain streets and you could make a shift just a little bit here or there, but it wouldn't be moving a current student. It would be more looking at here's a student coming in for kindergarten they're registering, maybe we need to make that move to move them to one school over another based on that enrollment figures. Uh, monitor the actual enrollment numbers against the data provided by Pennsylvania Economy League. We're very much looking forward to that study so we can get a better idea. Obviously work collaboratively with Mr. Brooks uh, to make sure that we're using our space the way it should be and, and you know for all intentions. And then monitor, monitor the new housing construction. That should say both new and reconstruction of housing um, so we have a better idea in each of the elementary catchment areas because I know like Wayne I just it's every day you drive by and Ethan's the same right now too you drive by and there's another house being rehabbed to bigger than what it was so it's great you don't have to carry a bag of dog stuff more than a block because there's always a dumpster around <laughs> in my neighborhood anyway yeah, so. Um, Do you guys have any more? I, I just wanted to say, because it, it, I know it's come up on occasion. First mm -hmm. of all, thank you both very much. That was yeah. really super informative. Really appreciate it. Uh, every year it comes up about what's the appropriate cutoff date for staffing. And I know, Ken, you made a point of asking, will we add our, add our uh, size guidelines at a particular date? I, I just want to say that I, I firmly stand by we've, the date is the date, and whatever happens after that date, you know, unless it's something so extraordinary, but no matter what our um, enrollment or our, si our class size caps are, mm -hmm. they could be even lower, they could be higher. There will always be people who will come in after a, a date, and there's just, you've got to rely as, a, as an administrator <coughs> on that at a certain date and time, you know who you have to hire and who you don't have to hire. And, you know, I know there's been talk of, well, maybe we should wait until later in the season, uh, the summer and closer to the beginning of the school year. It's just that it makes it really hard to do facility planning. And that, that phenomenon will always be there regardless of our class size. I think our boards talked pretty strongly about wanting to keep to class size, you know, the class size that we have. But I just support that there, there just has to be a date. Because yeah. you got to be able to plan. Well, it, you have to be able to plan, and, and parents, for as much as we complain about class size, we'd also be furious if we didn't know who the teacher was before Correct. we walk into before our kids walk into school the first day. Yeah. So we yeah. we understand you've got to plan, you've got to make arrangements. You teachers have to plan, right? They have to know who's walking in the first day, and hopefully do a little understanding of the kids. So Tony loves. And I think I think it's been better the last few years. I mean, we did used to use that third Friday in August as the cutoff date in previous years. 
And that made it not only difficult for the teachers, but for the administration as well. And, you know, they're in on that weekend That's reformatting late. classes, yeah. you know, to bring back. So I think the August 1st, at least the beginning of August, has been much more um, helpful in that situation. Okay. So any other questions, comments? And we'll, we'll be sure to go back and, you know, capture some of the things that, you, you know, what you brought up. You know, and get that information for you because obviously we'll be coming back once the Pell study is available to us. You'll yeah. want more additional information. And we'll have further discussion. I just wanted to thank you both. Thank you for all your work and thank all the principals. And, and uh, I know other administrators helped support this as well. So it was a lot of work put into this. So thank you both for all that yeah. you did. Maybe I can make a suggestion too. It's, um, we have left on the agenda capital budget and then a bleacher update. Well, we'll I, I was. Go ahead. You're the chair. I'll let you make well, yes. well, well, I spoke for an hour at the business meeting. I have an hour of questions on this, if that's all right. Just kidding. <laughs> this is a, I was like, say, hold uh, on. <laughs> I'm glad to see you're being consistent. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I was going to suggest that the capital budget we do with the finance committee. We're we probably going to have to review the same thing anyway with those people. So. We were going to, we were yeah, going to be touching six. both at both meetings, so right. that, that would work fine. And then maybe so we go through a bleacher, bleacher update. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the bleacher update, I'll just bring up to speed. Uh, we're still shooting for coming uh, before the uh, facilities committee in May with a report from the Schrader Group. Um, so consequently, we have been meeting with uh, um, the steering committee and uh, representatives of the steering committee, not only from an administrative standpoint, but we also have had um, the uh, architect and the um, representative from ELA come out to walk the site to have a much better understanding as to what we're talking about. So we're still formulating things, putting it together. Just want to give you up to date that we are still working f towards that goal. We still have a uh, another issue that we're looking into with regards to um, a structural engineer determining the wall as uh, two things, one of which is the retaining wall behind the existing bleachers uh, and the integrity of that wall as well as the depth of the foundation of the pool. The reason why I say that is um, the pool is much higher uh, ground level than the base where the football field is. Um, the dirt, if you look on behind uh, the bleachers that are currently there, there's dirt that support the retaining wall. If we were to take all that out, I want to make sure that we're not going to have a problem with the pool and the 200 plus thousand gallons of water suddenly having pressure that's going to want to have a tendency to push out. So again, we just want to make sure that we're safe on that. So we're doing some additional study on that for you as well. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So. All righty. Any new business from you, too? No. Okay. I had nothing from you. New me. business? All right. Public comment? Uh, if you'd like to make some comments, make sure you sign in over at the side before or after you're done. So, Mr. Hinkle, how are you? Yeah. You need to turn your little mic on. Up. Hi. Um, you all know me. I'm Chris Hinkle. I'm a junior. Um, just in support of the Bleacher Project here. Uh, last week you heard from my sister Lucy, and this week I'd just like to say that uh, the steering committee doing a lot of good, a lot of good work, and uh, we have a lot of options to consider. So I like that, um, and we're definitely on track to present some options at the May meeting, like Mr. Brooks said. Um, if anybody would like to meet me to walk the site and look at some of the challenges on the campus, I'd love to give you my email. It's uh, chrishenkel21 at gmail.com. If you need me to spell that, I can do that for you, too. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Anyone else? Going once. Oh. Can I just interject for a second? Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to meet with not only Chris, but several of the other students up at the high school to walk around, and they have provided some great insights from their perspective as to what uh, the use of that facility should look like and what we really need. So I really applaud the students for giving me uh, a different perspective on how they actually see how that working. And it's, uh, it's great being new here to come in and actually see that type of involvement. So thank you. I don't know about new. <laughs> what is new is old again, or what yeah, is exactly. old is new again? <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, you have to push the thing. Okay. Did it go? It's on. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm Colleen Price, and I'm on a, a member of the Environmental Advisory Council. I came here about a year ago, and since then, the Board of Commissioners has adopted the Ready for 100 program. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's about transitioning to renewable energy by 2030 for everything the township does. 
I know the school district is different, but I'm wondering if that might be something they might be more interested in. Um, so I have done a lot of research on solar panels for the uh, high school. It's the most ideal location because of its expanse. It's great because it's educational for the students, and I have a couple of companies that I've talked to. I just wonder if you have any interest in doing that. And you did you know, talk about the athletic fields, like those big lights that you have out there. They'd be awesome with a solar panel on the back. You don't need to hook that up to electricity. Um, so I was just, that's what I want to know, if there was interest in it and what we can do as members of the um, Environmental Advisory Council. And there was also opportunities to get some grants. Um, part of the thing that we did as our group, we applied to Sustainable Pennsylvania <coughs> for a certification, and we got a silver level. So we are now eligible to make a lot of applications for grants. One is for like driving PA forward with, to get an electric um, bulb charging station at the high school. So there's a lot of things that we can do. We want to offer our services, give you any information that you might need. So that's, that's why I'm here. Right. I know that you and I have been trading emails back and forth for a while, and then we just kind of stopped on that. Um, right. But, um, you know, your point of contact might be Mark, because he's kind of reviewing all of our energy usage, and, well, he's reviewing everything. So. OK. This is perfect timing. We've been waiting for Mark. Oh, perfect timing. We've been waiting for Mr. Brooks to come on board. So this is great that you came out tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay. Great. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Press. <laughs> this saves money, though. It's good. Yeah. Your to do list. Your, your to do list is like a, a roll of paper. It just keeps going. Um, is anyone else? Public comment? Anyone? No. Okay. And we're adjourned. <laughs>